inside the standard way is serenity first, inside afterwards. An alternative is inside first, serenity af afterwards. The third way is serenity and insight in conjunction. But whichever, whichever approach is taken, at a certain point, as said, the path is generated. This is what is the true Aryan or nobly called path. And then one pursues this path, develops and cultivates it. And as one is cultivating this path, the fetters are abandoned and the underlying tendencies are moved. So actually what causes the path, or let's say when the path reaches a certain point of culmination, then comes the direct penetration or seeing of the Four Noble Truths. And with that seeing of the Four Noble Truths, simultaneously a certain degree of, or a certain layer of the fetters are eradicated and certain deeply entrenched underlying tendencies to the defilements are uprooted so that they can no longer arise again. So this marks the attainment of the first stage of realization, which is called stream entry. And so with stream entry comes the first true seeing of the Four Noble Truths simultaneously. Usually, we th often people think of the Four Noble Truths as being the ABC of Buddhism. But actually, the Four Noble Truths is the content of the realization of, it's the content of the Noble One's realization. And so, up to that point, we have a kind of conceptual understanding of the Four Noble Truths. But as one practices, and the insight goes deeper and deeper. The mind turns away from everything conditioned and then takes Nibbana as its object of penetration. And with that penetration of Nibbana, certain fetters are cut off permanently so they can't arise again. But that attainment of the stage of stream entry is not the culmination of the path but one still has to continue developing the path. So that's why it says he pursues the path, develops it, and cultivates it. And so the stages unfold. We have four stages. The first Let's back up. There's a sutta, it's actually a series of suttas. I just have one as an example in which the Buddha speaks about the benefits or blessings of seeing the Four Noble Truths. So in this sutta, he takes up a little bit of soil with his fingernail and he says, asks the monks, which is greater? The little bit of soil that I have in my fingernail or the great earth. And of course the monks say the great earth is more, the little bit of soil you have in your fingernail is trifling. Then the Buddha says, so in the same way for a person accomplished in you who has seen the Four Noble Truths, the suffering that has been destroyed and eliminated is more, while that which remains is trifling. Because one who understands the Four Noble Truths has eliminated all the dukkha of samsara that will lie beyond at most seven more existences. Okay, so... Now leading to the realization of Nirvana, I made this little table. So we have the four stages of attainment. Each eliminates certain fetters or weakens certain fetters. And then this gives the number of rebirths remaining. So we have stream entry, which eliminates the three lowest fetters, the view of a substantial self in relation to the five aggregates, 
doubt about the Buddha and his teaching and clinging to precepts and other observances in the belief that <coughs> those are sufficient for liberation. And the street, with the attainment of stream entry, one eliminates, uh, let's say, one has at most seven more existences, either in the human or celestial realms, and one is finished with rebirth in the three lower realms, the hell realms, the animal realm, and the realm of the pretas, or hungry ghosts, or afflicted spirits. Okay, but then we're going to take a practitioner <laughs> who won't be content with stream entry, but who's going to go and attain the final fruit in this life itself. And by the way, in the morning when we recite the verse of Amish Nisanda, we speak about the four pairs of persons, the eight no types of noble ones. So the four pairs of persons are the, those who have reached these four levels of attainment and those on the irreversible path to these attainments. So that's four pairs, making eight types. Okay, at the second stage, suppose the person who reaches stream entry wants to go on, so they continue to cultivate their insight into the three characteristics. And when the faculties reach maturity, then they will come to the next level, which is called once returning. And this level, at this level, one weakens the coarser forms of greed, hatred, and delusion, though one doesn't eliminate any of them completely. And at this point, one has one or at most two more births in the human realm or in the celestial realms. But of course, the Buddha doesn't even praise rebirth in the celestial realms. Okay, so now the practitioner goes on cultivating serenity and insight, strengthening the spiritual faculties, and when the faculties come to maturity, they'll come at a certain point, if all of the conditions are right, they'll take place the next major breakthrough, which is the reaching the third level of attainment, which is called the stage of non-return. At this stage, one eliminates permanently the two fetters of sensual lust and aversion. And with the elimination of those two fetters, one doesn't come back into the realm of what's called the desire realm. There are these three layers or strata within sansara. We are in the desire realm, the human realm, the lower heavenly realms, and then the realms of misery all constitute the desire realm. And the fetters that bind us to the desire realm are basically sensual lust and aversion or ill will. So when those two fetters are eliminated, then if one doesn't go further to the final goal, then one will be reborn in the form realm, or the realm of fine matter especially in these states called the pure abodes, and one attains final liberation there without returning back to this world. But now we have a practitioner who's not content with that. Oops. And goes on <coughs> continuing to develop calm and insight. And then at a certain point, if the faculties are strong enough, this practitioner makes the fourth breakthrough to the attainment of arahatship. And so with that, one eradicates the five subtle fetters, that is desire for existence in the form realm, desire for existence in the formless realm where matter has completely disappeared. The subtlest kind of conceit, the conceit I am, the subtlest kind of restlessness that remains even in the mind of the non-returner, the very subtle kind of restlessness 
and then the subtlest trace of ignorance are all eradicated with that fourth breakthrough. <laughs> Just when I said that fourth breakthrough, <laughs> the screen disappears. <laughs> Emptiness. <laughs> I mean, the unconditioned appears. Okay, with that, there's no rebirth anywhere in any realm. So that marks the attainment of the complete realization of Nibbana. Okay, then I just have some texts which speak about that, lib that experience of liberation. So in this text, the Buddha is speaking about how the disciple develops the insight into the selfless nature, the non-self nature of all the five aggregates, material form, feeling, perception, volitional activities, consciousness, all, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all of these five aggregates are seen as they really are with correct wisdom. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And from that insight into the selfless nature of the five aggregates, one experiences a kind of disenchantment with them, a growing distance from them, then disenchantment leads to dispassion, viraga, through dispassion, the mind is liberated, and when the mind is liberated, there comes the knowledge, it's liberated. And one understands that this round of rebirths is finished, the brahmacharya, the spiritual life, has been lived to its end. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming back to any state of being. And then another text that I chose, okay, when his mind is thus concentrated, he directs it to the knowledge of the destruction of the asadas, the defilements, and he understands as it really is, this is suffering, this is its origin, this is its cessation, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. Then when he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the asava of sensual craving, craving for renewed existence and ignorance. And when it's liberated, again there comes the knowledge, it's liberated, birth is finished, and so on. And so then the text ends, and it's in this way that a person is one who in this very life dwells, having attained Nibbana, cools, experiencing bliss, having become, the text has Brahma Bhutto, having become holy. Okay, so this takes us through this verse on seeing the Four Noble Truths and the realization of Nibbana. Now we'll come, we come to the final main verse in the Mangala Sutta. The first in terms of the ground plan. So this verse that we just went through is, I gave it the title, The Ascent Towards Realization. And then the next verse is what I call, I give it the subtitle, the title Fulfillment embodying the world, transcending Dhamma, in the world. And so then we read together. Uttasa loka dhamehi Uttasa loka dhamehi Chitang yasa nakampati Chitam yasa na kampati Asokam virajam kemam Asokam virajam kemam Etam mangalam uttamam Etam mangalam uttamam The mind that is not shaken 
the mind that is not shaken, when touched by the vicissitudes of life, when, when touched by the vicissitudes of life, sorrowless, stainless, and secure, sorrowless, stainless, and secure, this is the highest blessing. This is the highest blessing. Okay, so this verse is in a sense showing the mind of the liberated one, of the arahat, while the arahat is continuing to dwell within the world. And what is sort of distinctive of the mind of the arahat is that because it's freed from all kilesas, all defilements, that there's no more sort of, uh, that it's no more subject to the fluctuations caused by the changes in worldly events. Some of the ways in which the text illustrate this. Okay, so it's said that there are eight conditions that are called the loka dhammas, the worldly conditions, and they form four pairs of opposites. And usually the minds of worldly people just are strung out between these four pairs of opposites. So we like gain, or the accumulation of profit and wealth, and we're upset by loss. When one's fame, and one is upset by either neglect or by, even worse, <laughs> by a bad reputation. And sometimes it happens that those who are most famous when the little secrets hidden in the cupboard, they call the skeleton in the closet, gets revealed, then their reputation collapses and it's disrepute, maybe even prison time. <laughs> no, seriously. Blame and praise, so we want to be praised and admired, and then when we're blamed and criticized, we're cast down. And then pleasure, we want pleasure. That's a source of happiness, is pleasure through the senses. And then pain, especially bodily pain, cast us down. So those are the pairs of worldly opposites. And so when one mind is liberated, the text says, gain and honor, do not obsess the mind. Fame and disrepute, don't obsess the mind. Blame and praise, don't obsess the mind. Pleasure and pain, don't obsess the mind. When it's not attracted to gain or repelled by loss, not attracted by fame, repelled by disrepute, not attracted by praise, not repelled by blame, not drawn to pleasure, not repelled by pain. So having thus discarded attraction and repulsion, one is freed from birth, old age, and death, from sorrow, lamentation, pain, dejection, and anguish. One is freed from suffering, I say. Then some verses from the Dhammapada. Uh, this is dealing with fear, especially with sorrow and fear. So it says, from attachment springs sorrow, from attachment springs fear. When one is wholly free from attachment, there is no sorrow. How then fear? And similarly, from lust, from craving springs sorrow, from craving springs fear. For one who is wholly free from craving, there is no sorrow. How then fear? And then another verse illustrating, again, how the mind is free from being swayed and shaken by the pairs of opposites. So here a monk named Sona has attained enlightenment and has come to the Buddha to make a kind of declaration of his attainment. So he says, when the monk is perfectly liberated in mind, even if powerful, visible forms come into range of his sight, they do not obsess his mind, his mind is not affected 
but it remains steady, attained to imperturbability, and the observes is vanishing. And so the same with sounds, odors, tastes, touches, and mental phenomena. In all these cases, the mind remains steady, imperturbable, and he observes its vanishing. And then he illustrates this with the simile of a stone mountain, a mountain of one solid mass of stone. If a violent rainstorm should come, I think it says from one direction, it could not make his mind, it could not make the mountain quake wobble and tremble. And so too, when a monk is liberated in mind, even if powerful forms and so on come into range of the mind, they do not obsess the mind. But his, remi his mind remains unaffected, steady, imperturbable, and he observes its vanishing. Okay, so this takes care of the verse that when touched by the vicissitudes of life, the mind is not shaken but remains sorrowless. So sorrowless is, of course, it's the absence of sorrow. Stainless is actually the rajan, which means absence of dust. Raja is dust. And so the dust is here referring to the defilements greed, hatred, delusion, and so forth. So the mind is stainless. Actually, what I would say is the causal factor is being stainless, being devoid of defilements. Because one is devoid of defilements, then the mind is a soka, sorrowless, not subject to sorrow, misery, dejection, and despair. And because one is now liberated from the prospect of continued birth and death, the mind is now secure, always stable and unshakable. And so that takes us through the, called the last verse of content, and then we just have one final verse which sort of sums up the whole content of the Mangala Sutta. So now we can recite that together. So, Etadisani Katvana Etadisani Katvana Sabata Muparajita Sabata Muparajita Sabata Sotin Kachantitam Sāvata sūtīṁ gācāṁ tītāṁ Te sāṁ mangala muttamāṁ Te sāṁ mangala muttamāṁ Okay, those who have fulfilled these conditions Those who have fulfilled these conditions Are, are victorious everywhere Are victorious everywhere They attain security everywhere they attain security everywhere. They win the highest blessing. They win the highest blessing. And notice a little change. You see, in each of the other verses, we have etang mangala mutabang, saying, this is the highest blessing. When we come to the last verse, it says, te sang, for them, mangala mutabang. For them, there is the highest blessing. Okay, so this wraps up the presentation of the sutta. But just before I open sort of the floor to questions and discussion, I just want to go back now to the whole ground plan. You see, I presented this when we opened this retreat on Friday evening as a sort of um, preparation for what we have lying ahead over the next couple of days. Now that all of the details have been f filled in by the explanations, now I think when we look through the ground plan we can see it, not quite in a new light, but in much more detail. We, 
much clearer understanding what, of what it entails. So now we go back to the beginning. So after the opening inquiry, we have the proper orientation whereby the Buddha lays down the kind of conditions that one needs to set out to lead <coughs> an ethical and spiritual life. And that is not to associate with foolish people, to associate with the wise, and to honor those worthy of honor. So this one, these kinds of right associations and the development of a sense of reverence plant in one's mind the conditions for discretion, the ability to make the right kind of moral discernment and to make the right decisions and judgments in order to adhere to the right path. Then one needs the secure foundations, so residing in a suit of, these are the inner and outer requisites for a successful ethical and spiritual life, residing in a suitable locality, and nowadays almost any place can be considered suitable if one makes the effort to find the right opportunities. Then having merits done in the past, which is the input from the past to the present, and the kind of admonition that we should be creating merits in the present in order to support us in future lives. And then through right resolution, one sets oneself on the right course. And remember I spoke about finding three particular areas in which you want to work on yourself and using an appropriate verbal formulation and then just reciting them every day as part of one's practice, even just once a day, and it's going to establish these grooves in the mind, maybe even in the substance of the brain, <laughs> that will be inclining you towards those wholesome qualities. Could be patience, generosity, kindness towards others, compassion, energy, diligence, whatever. Okay, then, assuming we have right here a young person preparing themselves for success in life, so they will need an education, some kind of training in a craft, trade, or profession, taking care of the practical, sort of preparing them for the practical side of life, but then they'll also need some kind of code of discipline to adhere to so that they're living an ethical life and especially they have to be careful with their speech to ensure that their speech is well spoken. Okay, then for the person who's going to enter upon the household life, we have fulfilling one's family responsibilities, supporting one's mother and father, maintaining the wife, husband, spouse, partner, whatever, and children after children, and earning what's living by a harmless occupation. And then at the same time, one is fulfilling the responsibilities within the family, one also extends the sphere of one, one's concern more broadly outside through the practice of generosity, righteous conduct, living in accordance with the ten types of wholesome deeds, helping relatives and friends in other blameless actions, which I say today would entail working for a more just, peaceful, and sustainable society and world. Doing so patiently, <laughs> but with determination. <laughs> Okay, then, as one sets out specifically on the liberating path, one begins with adopting a, per a life of moral integrity by desisting from evil, undertaking the five precepts, the code of abstaining from evil, especially refraining from intoxicating drinks, 
and then being heedful or diligent in all other types of wholesome practices. So this takes care of what we might call the manifestation of morality or ethics in action. But then comes the acquisition or the cultivation of inner virtues and planting the seeds of wisdom. So these two verses, one have, has reverence for those who are worthy of reverence, the objects of reverence. One has an attitude of humility, self-effacement, contentment, and gratitude for those who are help one in various ways. And then to advance what's the development of, um, in the Dhamma, from time to time one goes to listen to discourses on the Dhamma, one goes on retreats, and one also studies the Dhamma, now that we have printed books. Continuing the development of inner qualities, one practices cultivating patience, one is ready to accept the good, wise, compassionate advice of others, and then from time to time one sees renunciants, visits them, inquires, asks them questions, and hears the Dhamma from them. And then either with one's friends or with one's teachers, one engages from time to time in discussions on the Dhamma to learn more how to understand the Dhamma properly, how to practice properly. Okay, then to embark on what I call the ascent towards realization, one is now ready to practice the world transcending Dhamma. And so now one in a sense one steps on the gas pedal <laughs> by austerity, which is this combination of right effort and right mindfulness. And then one takes up the full spiritual life of the preliminary Noble Eightfold Path, and particularly now developing right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, or serenity and insight, guided by the right view. Then when serenity and insight, samatha and vipassana, come to their climax, then there arises the direct seeing of the Four Noble Truths, which sets one on the world-transcending, irreversible path to liberation. And as one cultivates that path, the successive layers of defilements are eradicated until when the mind is completely free from the defilements, then one attains Nibbana right here and now. And then we have the mind of the fully liberated one who has realized Nibbana as a mind that is unshaken by the vicissitudes of life, a mind that's sorrowless, stainless, or dust-free, and secure. And that takes us to the end of our exposition of the Mangala Sutta. And so the rest of this period I want to leave just open for questions, comments, discussions. Uh, okay. Could you talk more about the serenity and insight and the passion? Especially sort of the four paths. Yeah. And what's the serenity and Okay. Insight? Okay. Okay, so the Buddhist meditation is usually distinguished as of two kinds. One, the Pali word is samatha, which I translate here serenity, maybe not so satisfactory. And the other side is vipassana or insight. So the basic role of serenity is, or the development of serenity is to be able to sustain the attention continuously on a single object. So this is the practice, the sort of aim of this practice, the direction, is towards samadhi, 
the one-pointed unification of mind, and the reason that serenity or calmness is important in the development of the Buddha's path is because for insight to arise, the mind has to be freed from the mental hindrances, the qualities that cause, or the, the states that cause agitation of the mind, sensual desire, ill will, dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and doubt. Okay, so it's through the, success, the progressive development of samatha, or calmness, that the mind learns to hold a single, to remain steady, steadily fixed on a single object without vacillating. Okay, then, it, this is the normal sequence, then once one is able to sustain the mind on an object over a period of time without wavering, then one could use that focused and concentrated mind to start examining the nature of the body and mind. So sort of broadly speaking, the five aggregates. So usually one begins with the body, because the body is the coarsest factor, examining, sort of scanning the body, exploring the body, in order to experience, what they call, the nature of physical phenomena, to see them arising and passing. Then once, after examining and seeing the impermanent nature, of the bodily phenomena, then one can examine the mental phenomena, feelings, perceptions, volitions, even consciousness itself, one sees it, one sees them as constantly arising and passing away. So that is insight. So the normal sequence is to develop serenity first, then to develop insight afterwards. But this the sutta that I cited mentions an alternative method or an alternative approach, I should say. And this is developing insight first and serenity afterwards. So this is the, I say the, 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 the passage, or one of the passages which is taken as the basis for the method or approach to meditation that was developed, or this been, oops, that has been popular, that was popularized by the Burmese meditation master Mahasi Soyadot, studying about the middle of the 20th century. Though actually he learned this method from his own teacher. He was not the one who invented this method, even though nowadays people refer to it as the Mahasi method, <laughs> because it was Mahasi Soyadot who maybe spread that method through many other teachers. You know, made it more widespread. So this is a method which doesn't begin with focusing the mind steadily upon a single object, but it begins by noting, usually one takes a certain object as the basic, ob call it the basic observation post. It can be the rising and falling of the abdomen, or it can be the in and out breathing. But instead of just trying to keep the mind focused steadily on that fundamental, or that basic object, one will note whatever is occurring at any time within the course of contemplation. So as one is sitting, one might be observing rise and fall of the abdomen, but then if there are noises outside, one will attend to the noise hearing, hearing, or sound, sound. If there are pains in the leg, say, one will be paying attention, one will make the mental note, pain, pain. If the mind is drifting, one will make the mental note, drifting, drifting. If one is imagining something, when one recognizes this, one makes the mental note, imagining, imagining. And then one applies that same method of noting to all activities throughout the day. If one has to, well, when one eats, one pays attention to each phase in the process of eating. 
taking the food, lifting it, putting it in the mouth, tasting the food, chewing the food, swallowing, and makes the note in each way. And in this way, one is not focusing on a single object to develop a kind that stable samadhi, but by noting everything that's occurring at finer and finer levels, the mind develops a kind of secondary samadhi. They call this a kanika samadhi, where the mind is focused upon the ever-changing stream of experience. So the mind doesn't fluctuate or waver, but the object of the mind is constantly changing. And so this is a samadhi that develops on the basis of this constant noting of whatever is taking place, whatever one is doing. So that then becomes the insight, and then on, or that is the samadhi that develops on the basis of this mindful noting. And then through that, again, through the combination of the mindful noting and that samadhi, the insights into the impermanence, dukkha, and non-self arise. Okay, please. So I've, I've always struggled with the uh, the concept of rebirth, and um, and there's there's several things that seem paradoxical to me in yeah. that uh, one is the um, that of of the five aggregates, all are non-self. Yeah. So then, what's reborn? <laughs> Yeah, that <laughs> I'm sure this comes up all the time. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> it's my first time asking you. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that that is the question that's been, <laughs> been asked since the time of, <clears throat> I think it first comes, at least in, in literature, maybe it first comes in the, the work called The Questions of King Melinda, Melinda Panha, and just been asked, through the sense. Almost every time I give a Dhamma talk, <laughs> or a retreat, somebody will ask that question. <laughs> okay, so don't, don't feel uh, uncomfortable. Me and my past lives asking it, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so first we could raise the question like, in this life, if there's no permanent self, so what is it that means, maintains the continuity of personal identity in this life? And so we have the body, the body at least it presents, we call it a facade of sameness, since you can look at a photograph of yourself, maybe when you were one year old, and your mother will say, that's you when you were one year old. And then there's another in the photo book, you get the photo of you when you're five years old. Ah, that's me again. Now he's 15 years old, ah, uh, then he's 18 years old, 20 years old. So the body, you could see, if you look at yourself when you're one year old, very, very different. But there's a continuity of the body, so we say it's the same person. Okay, and then if we look at this probably from a scientific point of view, like all of the cells of the body are changing, so that they say that no cell endures more than seven years. Is that the case? Something like that. The atoms in your body are replaced. Yeah, and the atoms the are always changing. Atoms, subatomic particles, always changing. So similarly, the mind in a single life is always changing. So it's we can say that it's the four mental aggregates are always arising and passing away, but in the single life, they're arising and passing away on the basis of the same physical body. And because it's a single life, we have more or less the capacity for recollection. So we can recollect what I did a few days ago, I could recollect what I did a few months ago, I could recollect... <laughs> okay, I'm guilty! <laughs> Taking that book when I was in college, what, 6, 17, 18? 
So we have this continuity of memory, continuity of the body, so we say the same person. Okay, when death takes place, we would say the body can no longer serve as the support for the mental process, but as long, or for the stream of consciousness. But as long as there is the craving and clinging within that stream of consciousness, that clinging is clinging on to this body, now the body breaks down, it can't function anymore. But the clinging is there, seeking some organism with sense faculties that can experience an objective world. And so it's said that the stream of consciousness will then pass on and seek a new physical basis in order to, well, in which to lodge itself and then to continue the process of existence. And so it's the stream of consciousness which is always changing, so it's there's no unit within that stream of consciousness that's the same, but each occasion of experience passes on to the succeeding moments of experience, the, call it the accumulation of its tendencies, of its habits, dispositions, um, potential memories, and so they are embedded within the stream of consciousness, which then arises on the basis of a new physical organism. And then the life process starts again. But what usually happens, probably in 99.9% .9 of the cases, in the course of rebirth, because maybe of the force of the transition, the memory bank is pretty much suppressed. Because if we had to carry all of those memories over from life to life, would just be overwhelming. So maybe it's part of the wisdom of the process of transition that the memory bank is suppressed. But I said 99.9% .9 of the cases, because there are these remarkable cases of children who, when they're stuck, when they gain the ability to speak, will tell their parents you are not my only mommy and daddy, but I have another mommy and daddy living in such and such a village. And these, some of these cases have been investigated quite rigorously by, there was a professor of medicine at the University of Virginia, Ian Stevenson, who investigated hundreds of these cases using quite rigorous methods. You know, he wasn't out to publish books like The Inner Secrets of Reincarnation <laughs> or a Remarkable Case of a Child who was the, what, the, the rebirth of Augustus Caesar <laughs> or Cleopatra or so forth. But he would examine cases of these children setting up as rigorous controls as, were, as are possible. And then he's recorded these cases in a number of books, maybe the most accessible for relative beginners. Is it called 30 cases suggestive of reincarnation? And like he doesn't, he documents these cases and he tries to find other ways to explain how the child could have had such detailed information about a family living you know, maybe a hundred miles away. And generally, like the way he expresses his conclusion, he says, well, one might try to explain it in this way, one might try to explain it in that way, but the simplest explanation that involves the least number of um, unreasonable hypotheses is to assume exactly what the child is saying, that they are the rebirth of that person who passed away at such and such a time. And generally these cases of children who have re in these cases of children who have rebirth memories, what happened to their previous incarnation is that I think almost invariably they died prematurely. 
like they might have been hit by an automobile and died in an auto accident, or in one case I remember they drowned in a well, or they might have been the, vict the victim of a murder. And so because their life stream from the previous existence was cut off prematurely, it seems that the stream of consciousness still has a certain force in it which preserves those memories. And so when they come over into the new life, as soon as they're able to speak, they start speaking about their previous existence. Thank you. Supervisor? <laughs> um, I have a question on the attainment. Um, yeah. So would compassion have been fully developed? Um, yeah once one becomes a stream enter or is this is it something that keeps on needs to be uh, kept on being developed <laughs> <laughs> pardon my english yeah. um up until um enlightenment i would say that at the point of stream entry it's been developed up to a certain level but they would have to go on continuing to develop compassion through the successive stages okay thank you and just follow up. It, um, is it possible to do a parallel with the Bodhisattva path in, in the sense of like, yeah. how does the Bodhisattva path, um, okay, like is placed into this? The, yeah, <laughs> into this. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm presenting the scheme of liberation based on the text and the teachings of early yeah. Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Then the development of sort of the conception of the Bodhisattva path. Like a, it's a big story that took place gradually over time. So in the early teachings that we have coming from the texts like the Nikayas, the counterparts, the Agamas, there's no clear articulation of the Bodhisattva path as the distinct path. But that seems to have emerged first from the collection, actually in the early, well, let's say, the collection within the text of early Buddhism called the Jataka tales. Those are the stories about the Buddha's past lives when he was following the path of a bodhisattva. And the Jataka stories, at least some of them, relate to this performance of extraordinary deeds and his fulfillment of these extraordinary qualities, which then come to be called the paramis or paramitas. And then we have in again in the Pali Canon, the collections from early Buddhism, but from a somewhat later stratum, the text called the Buddha Vangsa, in which the Buddha is shown relating stories about how he, well, it goes back, the stories go back to the time of an earlier Buddha, I think it's the 24th previous Buddha called Deepankara, when at that time he was an ascetic named Sumedha, and he encountered the Buddha Deepankara, and he already had the qualities necessary to attain arhatship. He had mastered all of the jhanas, the supernormal powers, and so when he met the Buddha, he realized that if he wanted, he could receive the instructions from the Buddha and achieve arahatship. But he decided that out of compassion, he wanted to provide kind of boat or ship to liberation for countless other beings. And so he made, at the feet of the Buddha Deepankara, he made the aspiration to become a Buddha in the future. And then the Buddha, the Pankara, is shown giving him the pre prediction. In the future, you will become a Buddha by the name of Gautama, and you'll be living in such and such a time, and so on. So we could say that that became like maybe the first initial seed for the development of the Bodhisattva path. And then within the Theravada school, what's actually what's interesting is that the Bodhisattva path became much more elaborated in much greater detail in the sutra literature of the Mahayana Buddhism. 
and then in the later treatises of Mahayana Buddhism, like the treatises of Naga Nagajana and then the Yogacara Bhumi, much more extensive detail. But it also happened that the Theravada commentators, particularly the second generation of commentators, maybe because there was competition taking place in, in India. <laughs> so if they have the Bodhisattva path, we have to have a Bodhisattva path too. And so the second generation main commentator named Dharmapala then elaborated a Theravadan version of the Bodhisattva path in some of the sub-commentaries. What is his name again? Sorry, the commentator? Yeah, his name is Dhammapala, but I translated his treatise on the, par on the Paramis, as sort of the treatise on the Bodhisattva path in Theravada. So it's called A Treatise on the Paramis, and I had translated it actually way back in 1976. And when I was translating it, I was very puzzled by the way he was stating very authoritatively, like there are four of these that a bodhisattva has to fulfill, six of these, ten of these. I was wondering, where is he getting this information from? Is he just making this up? <laughs> <laughs> no, then I found some references It was a book by an Indian scholar. Maybe it was called something like The Bodhisattva Path or The Bodhisattva Ideal in Indian Buddhist Literature. And he was citing same passages, or at least very similar passages, ascribing them to a work which is part of the Mahayana Yogacara Bhumi. So that one of the chapters in that is called the Bodhisattva Bhumi. That's the stages of the Bodhisattva. And somehow in this library, Buddhist monastery library in Colombo, where I was staying at the time, called Vajrayama in the library, they happened to have a copy of the Sanskrit Bodhisattva Bhumi. <laughs> And I found those passages in the Bodhisattva Bhumi exactly, almost exactly the way Dhammapala included them in our Pali sub-commentary on the Paramis. So like this is a, an ancient example of plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> Except that plagiarism, I have to say, it's quite a Western concept. In Indian Buddhist literature, one commentator will take things from another commentator. There's no sense that this is mine, we have to give credit to it, but it's just continued, uh, con considered part of the received wisdom of the tradition. Yeah, but if you do a search in Google for the a treatise on the Paramis, you'll find that it's available online. Thank you. Um, and the third, um, but it, you talk about the person like unreturned, what like a return. Um, so, like if we know which stage we are, for example, is somebody born and he know um, that he's like like unreturned. So you talk about the stream, like the four kinds of. For example, for you, do you have some sense of which kind of situation? <laughs> 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 what is that? Um, <laughs> um, there are four kinds of... Um, yeah, there's four stages, yeah. Yeah, so for example, how do I know which stage I'm in? Like, is there somebody, some kind of hint, hint or something? Is there some... Um, like a message or something? <laughs> Some method? Intuition or like know how which stage I'm in. Yeah. Maybe I'm like only two like left. I think if one <laughs> has reached one of those stages, 
at a certain point, the sense will come to one that one has reached that stage. That's my supposition. Um, and and the, for Buddha, before Buddha, there's Buddha or not? <coughs> before Buddha? Yeah. Whether there was a Buddha or not? Yes. At the time that the Buddha appeared in the world? Yes. No, at the time the Buddha appeared in the world, there was no Buddha existing at that time. But according to Buddhist traditions, periodically, a Buddha will arise in the world. But it's, it can't be the case that as long as the teaching of one Buddha exists in the world, another Buddha can't arise in the world. Because it seems that, I don't know if that's what's said. I said that it's impossible, it's inconceivable that two fully enlightened Buddhas can arise in the world simultaneously. I, I can understand this part. What I confuse is that there's an infinite, so there's no beginning point. Yeah. So what about the Buddha? If a Buddha, there's a beginning Buddha. You know, there's no beginning Buddha because there's no first point, but throughout infinite beginningless time, there have been constantly Buddhas arising in the world, they'll teach the Dhamma, they will have disciples who will follow their teachings, attain liberation through their teachings. After their passing, their teaching will be passed down for a certain period of time, for the thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, I don't know. And then gradually over time it's said that the teaching sort of fades out, fades out, until it disappears. And then once the teaching disappears, then there's the opportunity for another Buddha to appear, to arise in the world. Could you be willing to share what practice you're working on now when you, when you meditate? Um, I do a combination of mindfulness of breathing and then full body awareness. Please. Is there a Mahasana method? Is that what Goenka teaches? <laughs> I think it's a little bit like asking, um, is the Apple computer, is that what, um, it's the Bill, Bill Gates is, is developing. <laughs> it's like the two are so, a, a bit like contemporary rivals. Not that they have a sense of rivalry or competition, but, okay, in, in Burma, middle of the 20th century, okay, sort of like one lineage is that of Mahasi Soyador. And Mahasi Soyador learned his, had his meditation, meditation training under an elder Burmese monk, from whom he learned this method of this constant noting. Okay, but there was another lineage coming down through a teacher called Uba Kin, who was a lay teacher, and he had learned it from another lay teacher, who, they say, learned it from another eminent Burmese monk named Lady Soyado. So I don't know whether that's really true or not. <laughs> so anyway, so Goenka teaches a different method, which Goenka's method is a method of using mindfulness of breathing, anapanasati, as a basis. And then after a certain period of practicing mindfulness of breathing, when the mind becomes focused and concentrated, then one scans the body to observe the sensations in the body, from the head down to the feet, and then up again. Yeah, so Goenka uh, uses one method, which I would say, for the short term, retreats, like his 10-day retreats, is very, very powerful. Whereas the Mahasi method to bring its true benefits usually takes a longer time. It builds up its momentum more slowly. But in a way, it's also more comprehensive, I would say, than the Govanka method. What would you say is the longer period of time? If one were to like set aside a certain time for retreats, so for Govanka it would be 10 days, Yep. You wanted to give a Mahasi method the full kind of opportunity. 
Yeah, I would say six weeks to two months. But of course, everything depends on the person, you know. So you can't make broad generalities about this. Somebody might go into the Mahasi method for <coughs> one week, two weeks, they might get very good results. But sort of the general consensus is that it works slowly and it takes you know, that persistence. Um, what language that's currently spoken today is closest to the ancient Pali language? Is it like a, it's like a, which language in India? I'm just curious. I can't say which is closest to the Pali, but we could say that there are different stages in the development of Indian languages. So the uh, let's say the what's called the Aryan languages. I won't get in because I don't know anything about the Dravidian languages. So there is the most ancient language is Vedic Sanskrit, which is of course it's the language used in the Vedas, and probably that has undergone several stages of development. I assume I'm not really yeah. in any way a specialist in this area, because I would assume from the Rig Veda to the Upanishads, there's some at least several hundred years, maybe even a thousand years of development. So I would assume that there's differences between the Sanskrit of the older part of the Vedas and the Upanishads. Okay, but this is putting it all together, it's called Vedic Sanskrit. Then say roughly in the time the Buddha was living, there was a proliferation of languages which are called Prakrits. Those would be spoken languages which are derived from Vedic Sanskrit, but in many ways they're sort of simplified and they absorb many terms and grammatical structures probably from local languages. Okay, and of the Prakrits, the Buddha would have spoken probably several of these Prakrits during his preaching tours, like the one which maybe that he used mostly is called Magadhi, the language of the state of Magadha. But he also spent a lot of time in Kosala, which is further to the north. So they probably had their own language and he probably would have spoken Kosalanese. We have traces of Magadhi because King Ashoka, who was capital was in the state of Magadha, had put up these edicts in the Magadhi of his time, which would be like about 150 years after the time of the Buddha. So Pali was just a written language. I could probably look this up. I'm well, sorry, it, was, it was originally part of an oral language. So the consensus among scholars is that Pali shows features of both the East Indian language and the West Indian language. So, so it, the, con the conjecture of scholars is that it's something of an artificial language which puts together features of the Eastern dialects and the Western dialects, which are very similar but little grammatical differences. And so I would guess that, okay, so this is the middle, it's called altogether these Prakrits and Pali are considered middle Indo-Aryan languages, middle period. Then over the time of evolution, then comes classical Sanskrit maybe formulated, the rules formulated, the 3rd century BC, and then even the Pali text gets subject to a partial process of Sanskritization. And other versions corresponding to the Pali get actually translated into Sanskrit, or to some blend that's called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. Okay, then the languages evolve down to the present where we have languages like Bengali, Hindi, Marathi are descendants of Middle Indo-Aryan. And so you could, one could see certain resemblances between words in Hindi and in Bengali and in Pali. But of course, a lot is so different that we can't recognize. So. Um, I had a question about your chart. Um, 
So the first, third, and fourth categories seem to have really clear definitions, like really binary, you've like achieved it or not. The second one, once returner, um, you described as weakens greed, hatred, and delusion yep. for the fetters eliminated, but it's the one category that doesn't have like a numbered list of fully eliminated. Yeah. So I'm just wondering like, um, is there a clear distinction? Is there a clear marker? How do you, how do you distinguish? Yeah, in, in this case, there isn't that clear marker. All the text says is that one weakens or, you know, it just says one weakens or diminishes greed, hatred, and delusion. But it doesn't, there's nothing about eliminating anything. Um, so I like... The, Wait, let me, did somebody in the back have a question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just, uh, so back to the entire idea of uh, serenity and insight. Yeah. Um, and and I, I really found it very useful, you know, that you had different descriptions about how, or, how one may achieve those. I find, and this is mostly about my own practice, I find, um, you know, the moments when I may, uh, like when I sit, you yeah. know, um, that my mind just, I get like, just all these like horrible, not horrible thoughts, but, you know, like, you know, yeah, yeah, like horrible thoughts. <laughs> No, no, no. So, no. what would you recommend? <laughs> it's yeah. Not a yeah, first of all, it might sound paradoxical that I say this, but the fact that what you call the horrible thoughts come up and you notice them, that is actually a good sign. You see what is happening, <laughs> again, I'm sorry to say this, but <clears throat> when we don't do a practice, the horrible thoughts arise, <laughs> but we don't no, notice them. And so they're operating in the background of the mind and controlling us, but we're not aware of them. And so what is happening when one sits is that one is creating a kind of open space or a kind of blank background in which the content of the mind starts to become exposed to view. And so to notice what's going on, that is like an important stage in development. Yeah, so don't, when we use this expression, serenity, don't, it's really samatha is, well actually it does mean sort of becoming peaceful. <laughs> um, but it doesn't mean that as soon as you sit that you're going to become serene and peaceful. But this is a kind of process of, I like one of my teachers, he used spoke about like the three stages in the development of mindfulness. The first, he says, is knowing the mind. Then the second, shaping the mind. And then the third is freeing or liberating the mind. So first one has to come to know the contents of the mind. And one finds, and this is quite natural and normal, that when when first sits down, you know, to start med meditation in a session, that a lot of stuff comes boiling up to the surface. And one really has to be patient with that stuff that's boiling up and just you know, let it come up, be aware of it, and just let it go its own way. And just hold to the post of the observer. Yeah, knowing the mind, shaping the mind, and freeing the mind. Um, so, with regards to the practice that we build up, um, is it kind of assuming multiple lifetimes or rebirths? Um, is the progress or practice that we build up cumulative? Um, or is it 
kind of all or nothing. Like if you haven't achieved a certain yeah. category within a lifetime, you start from zero again for the next lifetime. Or is it, okay, well, you like maybe made 70% of the way to the first one, you didn't quite hit it. But <laughs> you get to like reap the like benefits of what you... I assume that it's cumulative. <laughs> if it weren't cumulative, then... Yeah, we're seeing that one is putting in so much effort and then it all gets wiped out that it's... Is that this game go back to start? Monopoly? Is that a monopoly? Excuse me? Yeah, monopoly. In monopoly. Go back to the beginning. Yeah. But I don't think it's always this, that... Okay, let's say we're starting here. Then one is practicing so diligently here, then one passes away, and then so <laughs> as soon as one comes to maturity, one is starting off right here and then continuing like this. Maybe one has to go through like a lot of, you know, it's a lot of experiences that represent the manifestation or working out of other past karma. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is that the accumulations that one makes in any particular lifetime um, are carried across to the next lifetime and are there as the potentials. And so this is the importance of doing what they call the deeds of merit, since that is what creates, I would say, the lightness and, <coughs> and disposition of the mind towards the Dharma, and also it's these merits that create the connections or that opens one up to these connections with the Dhamma. So, you know, when those meritorious formations are there, just somehow, almost inexplicably, some kind of connection will open up. What walks past, say, in my case, many, many years ago, it was like going down to Chinatown with some of my friends from college going to the Chinese restaurants, then walking past the window of the shops and seeing the Buddha images in the shops and the Kuan Yin <laughs> images, then I was sort of fascinated by those Buddha images and the Kuan Yin images. And then I started to read about Buddhism. And, but my friends who were with me were sort of pulling me, come on, why are you, stop, why are you stopping and looking in the window with the you know, so nothing registered with them, but it did with me. Mm. Oh, you had you had a question, I think. Um, if nobody. Yeah. Has, um, so I like your teaching very much, and it's very um, it's very um, insightful. And you talk about the reciting for some of the monks, uh, the monks uh, reciting. So for our lay people. If I want to deepen the learning, um, is a reciting yeah. a good method? Because we don't have that kind of routine schedule for that. And also, what kind of a book list um, yeah. you recommend so I can have a, um, a systematic uh, learning of the of Buddhism or Sutra? If you want to have a, a systematic, uh, systematic learning. Yeah. Um, Okay, first for recitation. Is there material on Probably. Yeah. I, there's one little book that was published in Sri Lanka that I used to use back in my early days in Sri Lanka, and you could find it online. It's called The Mirror of the Dhamma, I think. No, I have it on my other computer. Yeah, but if you write that down, The Mirror of the Dhamma, and it has the basic, um, like recitations, like the ones that we were doing in the morning here. It has the three refuges, the five precepts, and the recollection of the three jewels, and it has various other sort of meditations. And then it has what we call the three blessing suttas, the Mangala Sutta, then the Metta Sutta, the Sutta on Loving Kindness, and the Ratana Sutta, the Sutta on the Three Jewels. So you could download that little book 
and you can find whatever kind of recitations appeal to you, and you can do like a little recitation every day. And that's a very good practice because it imprints on the mind the qualities of, or the reverence for the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, and also the precepts, sort of to guide one's conduct during the course of the day, and then other suttas that generate faith and also understanding. So remember the mirror of the Dhamma. It was published by the Buddhist Publication Society, and it was compiled by two Sri Lankan monks. I think it was Venerable Narada and Venerable Kasapa. The language might be a little old, the English, because it was compiled, I think, in the late 1940s. Okay, maybe we have time for one more question. Somebody who didn't get a chance to ask a question yet. Um, I just wanted to see the chart that you mentioned you had with the six paramitas. Excuse me? You mentioned that you put the six paramitas along with the oh. six paramitas. And mm -hmm. also, if you could just explain again the practice. Is it just sort of remembering it? Or just like recite, just sort of saying something um, to yourself? Is that how you mean with the paramitas? Yeah. The paramitas? Well, what I said is, this is a way to dispose the mind, to train the mind, or condition the mind towards those qualities of the paramitas. So when one recites them every day, or just even chooses three of them, as I said at the beginning, then one is building up the force of those qualities within the mind. And so then those qualities will come into play and sort of guide one's actions in one's everyday life. So reciting is just, may I have... Excuse me? Reciting is just basically saying, may I have patience, may I have... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, it, it, you know, reciting is not sufficient in itself, but it's, as I said, it disposes the mind towards those qualities. And if you could show us the chart at some point, if you could see the chart... Reciting. If you could see them? Yeah. Um, I think I have them on my other computer, but I could send them to mm -hmm. Giovanna, and yeah. she could share them with people who registered for this course. Okay, I think it's getting time for closing. And one thing, before we close, can I make like a little pitch for my Buddhist Global Relief? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. Yeah, plus, okay. Um, yeah, this was 10 years ago, together with some friends and students, we formed an organization called Buddhist Global Relief, which has as its mission helping people around the world who are afflicted with the problem of chronic hunger and malnutrition. And over the 10 years of our existence, we've launched and fulfilled many projects which are helping poor communities in countries around the world, not only in Buddhist countries, but throughout the world, without any discrimination based on religion. So we have projects ranging from, out from Mongolia through Vietnam, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Kenya, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Haiti, Peru, Nicaragua, and the United States. Some of the projects aim directly to give needy communities access to food, directly direct access to food. Others are attempting to deal with the underlying roots of hunger and malnutrition. So a lot of the projects are designed to enable children, poor children, and especially girls, to go to school and to receive meals at their school. And so through some of these projects that have been going on for years, some of the girls in Cambodia and India who started out coming from the poorest, most downtrodden layer of, society, of their society are now going to college. Some have completed college and university. Okay, so the main way in which we raise funds for these projects 
is every year we have a walk to feed the hungry, and the walk takes place in about 10 locations around the United States, including New York, Michigan, St. Louis, Philadelphia, um, now this year it will be in Berkeley, California, Seattle, Washington, Portland, Oregon. But our major walk, the largest one, takes place in New York City. And this year it will take place on October 27th, that's the last Saturday in October. And it takes place at the Riverside Park in Manhattan, at the 79th Street ent entrance. And as always, it's a joyful event, and people from different sanghas, different Buddhist groups come together, and we do the walk together. It's about four, I think it's about a four, four mile walk, and then we come together at the church off Riverside Park for a communal meal with some short Dhamma talks and an overview of the BGR projects. And so I have a sheet about the walk, which I'd like to sort of make available. Maybe I could put them at the entrance. Yeah.